Mr. Speaker, is move some of the subsidy that is presently given on a non-revolving basis to the universities into the loan pool of the Student Loans Bureau and relend that at concessionary rates, 1%, 1.5% to students to be, to be paid back on a 30-year term. So in other words, Mr. Speaker, the allocation that the government makes on a yearly basis to the universities, it could take a percentage of that, put it in the pool, and relend it, but lend it at very low interest rates, 1%, 1 1.5% maximum. Expand the terms, 30 years, and that will have negligible impact upon the monthly repayment of students. No, but because you'll be using it to pay back the fees. Mr. Speaker, the other thing, Mr. Speaker, that I believe the Parliament needs to make up its mind on in terms of dealing with the funding of tertiary education is that, like a house where you save towards a mortgage, we have to develop the culture in Jamaica where parents start to save for tertiary education. And so the government must establish a saving program and back it, in fact, should try and match what parents save to encourage them to put funds away from early. Now, Mr. Speaker, in effect, what this does is to create an additional revenue stream for the student loan. Because those funds go into the student loan, students who are now studying use it and pay it back so that when you come to get your student loan, the funds are there. So, Mr. Speaker, I've given three suggestions that I've given them without any reservation that they are good for the country. And I would hope, Mr. Speaker, that if the government accepts the proposition that we need to now have a review of the last phase of education reform and set up a new community, com committee to do that and look at the next phase of education reform, Mr. Speaker, I would be prepared, ready and willing to participate in that and give my full support to the government on that. Mr. Speaker, there must be consensus around the urgency of school improvement. Too many schools are still failing our students. And there is a reluctance to act decisively to fix the problem. There is now a wealth of data collected by the National Education Inspectorate to collectively, to objectively rather, classify the performance of schools. We started work on a special set of policies and legislation called the School Improvement Act to define in law the procedures, powers, roles, and responsibilities of critical stakeholders in school improvement. It would set critical benchmarks and trigger automatic intervention to avoid entrenchment of failure and systems breakdown in school. Mr. Speaker, improving the performance of schools is a critical step in removing GSAT as a placement mechanism. Mr. Speaker, for many parents and children, GSAT is excruciating punishment. And I, Mr. Speaker, would love to see the day when Jamaican children have equal access to the highest quality education regardless of their address or socioeconomic background. We want to see a Jamaica where every school performs to a high standard. And you know what that would do, Mr. Speaker, Minister of Education? It would make parent choice not so much about 
the quality of the school, since all schools are equal. But now parents would now start to look at proximity. How far will my child have to travel? And offering, does the school offer music? Does it offer Spanish? Does it offer Chinese? So you begin now to go deeper into education in terms of selecting what is best for your child. So Mr. Speaker, I would love to see the day when all our schools, all our schools are performing at the highest standards. And it is possible. We want to see a Jamaica in which the parent can close their eyes and send their child to any school, any primary school, and know that their child will be literate, numerate, articulate, cultured, safe, and of critical thought. Mr. Speaker, as Minister of Education, when it came time for students to be enrolled in primary school, I mean, I'm not even talking about after GSAT, but when parents start to try to select schools for their children in May, thereabouts, there would be a, a deluge, and Minister, you know this, of parents calling you. Can you get my child into X school? I said, where you live? Portmore. But the school is in Kingston. I don't mind. I want to get my child into that school. Why? Because they know, they know that it is all about life chances. The distribution of educational access is all about life chances. So Mr. Speaker, the type of education system that we have now is a kind of Darwinian survival of the brightest. Yes, it is a meritocracy. The brightest children through GSAT get access to the best schools, which usually, invariably, have the best teachers. We must admit, Mr. Speaker, we must admit that bright children from poor households do get a chance to access preferred places. I have a few in my constituency, and I'm certain you know, my colleagues here can speak to cases where children from poor households do get a chance to go to the preferred schools because they are naturally bright. So the Darwinian system selects the brightest as it would select the fittest. But Mr. Speaker, the correlation between household income and GSAT performance is very high. There is a very high positive correlation between household income and performance on GSAT. What does this mean? This means that children from higher income households are more likely to get better places and eventually better life chances, thereby continuing the virtual cycle of higher income giving you access to better education. Your children get access to better education, they get access to higher incomes, and then it goes on for them. But for children who are poor, Mr. Speaker, they get, they are likely to be placed in poor schools with poor